morning and aloha. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Let's do better than that. Let's go. One more time. Aloha. Aloha. That's, here we go. Here we go. My name is Glenn Higa. I am the president of the Hawaii Parkinson Association. Yeah, Glenn! <laughs> Thank you, Jan. On behalf of the board of directors and our volunteers today, it is my honor to welcome everyone to the 2024 Hawaii Parkinson Association Symposium. I want to say first mahalo to our sponsors for their generous support and please visit their resource tables if you haven't already done so. I would also like to thank our panelists for sharing their expertise and their knowledge with us. Thank you to our volunteers for their time and energy this morning. We couldn't do this without you. Finally, mahalo to all of you for attending the 2024 symposium. To learn more about exercise, nutrition, speech, swallowing therapies as it relates to Parkinson's disease. The mission of the Hawaii Parkinson Association is to positively impact the lives of people affected by Parkinson's through exercise, I'm sorry, through support, programs, education, and other services. As the number of cases of Parkinson's continues to grow in Hawaii, HPA must do the follow, must do so as well. And we're doing so, we're doing this by concentrating on three key areas. We're increasing the number of support groups, working towards our goal of no one living alone or in isolation with Parkinson's. We're expanding our outreach efforts to spread awareness of HPA and our mission. And we need to educate underserved communities, the business community as well, and the healthcare industry about Parkinson's, just to name a few groups. If you are interested in volunteering on our support group outreach or education committees, or if you're interested in starting a support group in your community, or would like more information about support groups available, please reach out to us at our resource center at 808-762-0600 or via email at info at parkinsonshawaii.org. Speaking of our resource center, we have new hours. We are now open Tuesdays from 10 a.m to 1 p.m. We're also open on Thursdays. One to four. One to four, thanks Pat. <laughs> Sorry, Parkinson's problems. Can't flip the page too well. Thursdays from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We're also looking for volunteers to staff our resource center. If you're interested, please see the dancing lady back there, Pat Bemis. She's our resource center manager. And, and she will gladly take your information. We hope you enjoyed today's symposium and arm yourself with enough information to become your own Parkinson's advocate. At this time, I'd like to introduce our vice president and today's moderator, Kevin Lockett. Thank you. Thanks, I just have a couple of extra announcements. First of all, a shout out to the committee that put this together. So it's uh, Glenn Higa, Kai McDermott, Lisa Kirk, Pat Bemis, and Jack Sutherland. Thank you guys for, let's give them a, thanks. So uh, Glenn took some of my announcements, so uh, this will be a little bit <laughs> quicker. Uh, one announcement um, is we are going to be starting a harmonica pilot, harmonica for Parkinson's class. So we're using the Windward Support Group, which meets the second Wednesday of each month uh, at Pohanani at two o'clock. Uh, so the next one is May 8th. So if you are interested in being part of this pilot class, all I can tell you, I'm going to just guarantee you're going to have more fun than you should be allowed to have. So please uh, uh, let me know if you're interested. We have 20 harmonicas, key of C, and we are, yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. On that note, um, HPA put in for a grant to study the benefits of harmonica for, for speech and swallowing as adjunct for speech therapy. And so uh, if we get the grant, we'll be looking for people to participate in the, the, this class and we'll do some pre and post testing. If you are interested in being a part of that, uh, in the registration table, there's a sign up list. Just, just write your name, email, and phone number. So when we, when or if we get the grant, we'll be able to contact you and, and give you more information. So, so please, please do that. Uh, one more announcement. Um, a very important one, the bathrooms. So uh, if you haven't found them yet, you go out here, make a left, you'll see the courtyard 
and turn right, you'll see signs. Be careful, it's kind of kind of slippery out there, and I would suggest using the perimeter. It's a lot, a lot drier, a little bit safer. So, okay. So uh, we're gonna, we have a, a big agenda today. We have three panels. We have uh, experts for each panel. And what we're gonna do is I'm going to, I have some questions that we solicited before the event that we'll start with. But if you have questions, uh, I, will, I will ask you and just raise your hand, we'll bring you a mic and we wanna make sure that your questions get answered. If we don't get to all the questions for each panel, what we're going to do is they're going to answer them offline and we're gonna post it on our website shortly after the event, okay? And then lastly, we are doing a video, professional video of this event, so uh, it'll be available a couple weeks after as well and there'll, there'll be a link on our website and that is parkinsonshawaii.org. Okay, perfect timing. All right, so let me introduce our panelists. Okay, so the, the first topic is uh, exercise. Uh, <coughs> panelist said, uh, Dr. Lauren Turpak is a movement disorder fellow. Raise your hand, thank you. Um, at Queens Medical Center, she completed her uh, medical training in Florida and joined the Queens team in July of 2023. She's passionate about caring for Parkinson's patient and, and continuing ways to maintain and improve a good quality of life. So thank you, Dr. Turpak. Let's give her a welcome. Next on the panel, we have uh, uh, Sandy Webb. Sandy's a registered nurse since 1979. She was also a triathlete, fitness instructor, and a competitive golfer in the day. She said her handicap was 18. Still is, Still is. okay. She's uh, currently a certified Rocksteady boxing instructor. Her and her husband started a medical cannabis clinic in Hawaii. Um, and she is also a care partner for her husband. Living well with Parkinson's is a top priority of her life. So welcome, Sandy, thank you. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, our last panelist is Joanne Sinter. Joanne is the activities manager at Pohanani, a senior community in Kaneohe. Uh, jo has over 20 years of experience in senior wellness. She holds a BA in sociology and a certified personal trainer and a certified senior fitness specialist. She's a strong believer in health and wellness. She shares her passion through creative exercise programming to, help, to enhance the lives of, of her residents. For the past nine years, Jo has been leading a Parkinson's exercise class, which focuses on gait, mobility challenges, as well as voice and speech exercises. She truly loves helping the residents improve, improve their well-being and to live well with Parkinson's. So thank you, Joanne. Okay, so we're gonna get started. Uh, I have a, first, a couple of questions. If you have some, start thinking about them and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask for your, uh, to raise your hand. So um, the first question, oh, actually before we do this, something really important, I have a dad joke. <laughs> So why isn't the personal trainer paying his rent? He's squatting. Okay. Okay. First, uh, don't encourage me, don't encourage me. All right, so it's the first question, and actually there's two questions, we're gonna combine them. Can exercise slow down or prevent Parkinson's disease? So I'm gonna to toss that one to Dr. Turpak. All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Wonderful. First of all, thank you all for coming this morning. You're early on Saturday, you're all here. Oh my goodness, it's just such a testament to um, how well you wanna take care of yourselves and how we can help you. So we appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Um, so yeah, this is a super important question and one that we get asked very often in the clinic. And I'm super excited to share the stage with these ladies so they can give you an idea of some of their perspectives too. And so the question is, can exercise slow or kind of stop some of the Parkinson's symptoms? And I will tell you that based off of the studies that are out there, okay, that exercise is the one thing that we know can at least slow down some of the progression, okay? And it's better than any prescription that I can write you. So certainly we have medications that can help treat symptoms. And in a lot of ways, the medications that we give you are also to help you feel better, to increase your quality of life, but maybe 
if you think about it and frame it this way so that we can get you to be able to exercise more and be more active. So this is such an important thing for us. And it sounds so, you know, gosh, kind of mundane, just diet and exercise. Well, we know that this promotes brain health. And so in general, when the brain is happy, the Parkinson's is happier, okay? So exercise we know promotes dopamine. And as you guys know, that dopamine is something that we're missing in Parkinson's. So it's not really the dopamine itself, it's that the transporters in the brain, they don't work quite as well in our Parkinson's patients. And so the exercise helps our body, helps our brain try to promote other pathways to say, hey, we really need this and so we can move better. Um, so really just in a nutshell, the basic answer to that question is yes, it does help. So anything that we can do, and we'll get into that a little bit more here, it's gonna be really helpful for you. All right, all right. Anything to add? Yeah, so no, she covered <laughs> it perfectly so, well. So, yes. so there, there was a, a, a something a little bit exciting, and, and we're kind of wait and see what's going to happen. Is there was a, uh, there has been. So we know that the Parkinson's treatments are symptomatic. They will help you deal with the symptoms, help you with the symptoms, but none of them slow down disease. So the only thing that we we know for sure is that physical activity does, and that's been shown in animal studies. Uh, a recent study that was just released literally a couple of months ago. Um, it was the first time that they, they indicated there may be a hint of it actually reversing a little bit of uh, what's going on in your brain with Parkinson's. And uh, not to get, it's exciting, but don't, it, it, was a, it was a small study of 10 subjects, but the exciting part of that study is that they used uh, brain imaging. So instead of, you know, it was, was very objective and they were actually seeing positive changes uh, in the brain. And so, so more to come on that. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of share that because that, that's pretty much hot off the press in the last uh, two months. So, okay, next question. Um, what is the best exercise for Parkinson's? Joe, I'll have you. Well, we know that exercise, I mean, it's clearly obvious that exercise is very important for Parkinson's. Um, the American, American Parkinson's Association recommends four different types of exercise. Um, so one would be an aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise can be anything from walking briskly to um, riding a, a bicycle to um, doing something like more um, like swimming or something more more higher intensity aerobic. Um, and then the next one would be strength training. So some kind of resistant training, whether it's against um, uh, handheld weights or body weight or using TheraBands. Um, and the next one would be flexibility work. And so that could be done through a, you know, through a, a yoga class or through an exercise class where they're focusing on you know, big stretching motions, um, either dynamic or static stretching. And, and then the next one would be balance. So working on balance is so important. Um, whether you're doing it on your own, um, either dynamically or in a class or you're taking a Tai Chi class or some other sort of um, exercise class where you're really focusing on your balance and postural instability is really important. So um, having said that, the most important exercise is the one that you'll do. So um, if you're not interested in all of that and you really just love going rollerblading or you love going um, dancing, ballroom dancing, or you love boxing, and that's the exercise that you'll do, then that's the one that you should be doing. So um, it's most important that you're just moving your body. Um, we know that even with 20 minutes of exercise a day, that can be beneficial for the symptoms of Parkinson's. So, um, so whatever you can do, um, just get your body moving, really important. Perfect. I can't add anything to that. <laughs> One you'll do. <laughs> okay, the, the next question. Uh, what is the best time of day to exercise? Is, does that matter? Um, good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the best time to do your exercise is kind of like she said, whenever you'll do it. <laughs> and try to not be resistant to your care partner's help for you. That's a really big part of exercise is that the athlete doesn't really want to do it and then has problems because their partner is saying, come on, we got to do this. That is really important to just do the one, 
the exercise. One you like best. All right. All right. Okay. We have a question. Oh, yeah. Can you hold on for one second? Oh, sure. Okay, we'll bring the mic to you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I have a loud voice. Oh, no. You, you raised your hand, so you have to. Right We're videotaping it, too, so we want to make sure that they, they can hear your, your question. Can one exercise too much? Oh. That's a good question. I don't believe that you can unless you exercise so much that you end up on the couch the rest of the day. That's not really good. One little pearl that my husband and I use, because he goes to class um, three times a week with nudging. He plays golf. But one of the things we use is when we're home, we have lots of chores to do at home. Chores can count as a form of exercise and movement. It's called activities of daily life. You cannot stop doing your activities of daily life. It's very important. It could be a starting place for you if you're doing nothing now. Think about the things you do at home that actually help you around your house, your balance. Those things are all very, very important. And so doing those, so what I was getting at is we'll take breaks and then I'll say, hey, the, water, the front yard needs to be watered, go. 15 minutes of watering. That's a lot of balance and movement to walk around your yard. So anything you can do to help yourself at home is really good. It's a starting place, at least. And your care partner will love it. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, so um, one of the things that I do um, at, at Pohainani is I work individually with people with Parkinson's. And what I do spe um, specifically is we keep uh, a log on what they're doing and how they're feeling. Because sometimes they might overdo it. They might do too much. And then they feel really tired the next day or later that day, like Sandy was saying. So, um, you know, monitoring your symptoms, you know, really keeping track of that and where your medication, when, where you're, when you're taking your medication as well, you know, working with your healthcare provider to make sure that, you know, you're timing that all specifically. And it might change, right? It changes. Some days you're just going to feel great. Some days maybe you don't feel that great. So really, really journal it. Um, that seems to help my residents for sure. The last thing I'll say to that um, from the uh, physician standpoint is consistency. So that's the one word I'm going to give you, consistency. So rather than pushing yourself, you know, 100%, uh, I'm just going to do everything all at once. And then exactly as we're overtired, we're on the couch and, you know, TV's looking really good. I'd much rather you do a little bit less and work up, you know, slowly to increasing the amount that you do because consistency is what's going to keep those dopamine levels a little bit better. And then also, if you miss a little bit here and there and you're tired that day, it's okay. Give yourself some grace. Um, you know, so don't, you don't want to get into a cycle where you're frustrated and then exercise becomes an enemy to you rather than a friend. So consistency and give yourself a little grace. Great. Is there any other questions for the audience? Okay. While we're getting the bike out, I'm going to ask another question. Um, should I take my Parkinson's medication before or after I exercise? Sure. Um, yeah, so that's an excellent question as well. So, and honestly, it's a little bit individualized. So I would say probably in general, you might want to take it beforehand, right? Because, or at least as we're planning to exercise. So let's say if you're planning, oh my gosh, I'm, I want to do this exercise class at nine o'clock in the morning. And it takes, you know, 20 minutes for my medication to kick in. Having a little bit of that planning ahead of time and saying, okay, you know, I really want to be kind of at the peak of my medication where it's working really well so that I can move the best and feel the best so that you can be more invested in that exercise. And it's, you're fighting against yourself a little bit less. Um, so, and it's kind of different for everyone because everyone has a little bit different response to the medication and how their body interacts with it. So sometimes maybe we might even have too much movement with our medication. And so it's really just kind of timing that, um, cause you want to be able to execute the movements as best as you can. And so, like I said, it's, it's really an individualized answer, but in general, I would say it's probably best to try to time it to where that medication's working well for you. So again, you're fighting against less of that slowness and stiffness so you can feel a little bit better. 
second end. I was going to add about timing. So to say, we'll just go keep going on the 9 o'clock, because it's easier that way. We go to an 11 o'clock class, so it's easier. But so with Parkinson's, your, your whole body slows down, so your gut has slowed down as well. So your breakfast should be timed as well. You should eat at least an hour before one you're going to exercise, but you should eat an hour or take your medicine on an empty stomach or wait an hour, half hour, hour after you eat. Because if you think about it, if you go to exercise and your gut is slow and you just ate and just taken a pill, it's all going to be slowed down even with exercise. Because when we exercise, our body uses not the food in our stomach. It uses the food in our body. It uses our own stores of glucose. So to have a big wad of food in your stomach when you're going to exercise could slow everything down. You can still have a pill in there when you're scheduled to take another pill. Then you might be overdosed. So timing of your food and your medication is good any time, but especially on exercise days. Great. So I had a question over here for uh, Tommy, and then I'll get you in next. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Does anybody know of a place you can go to get exercises that are designed for you in Parkinson's? Like, I belong to 24 Hour Fitness, and I can go there anytime I want. But I, I, I signed up real early, so it's only $12 a year, or $20 a year. But I would like to find somebody that I can work with that, um, that will give me a little bit of feedback coming through this microphone. So, so uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to uh, phrase your question, Tommy. So, so Tommy's asking, is there uh, a place to go where you can get specialized or get set up on a Parkinson's exercise program? Um, does that pretty much answer that, or? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, I know that the I don't know if the Y is still doing. Are you you're looking for more specific, like one on one or a cl or class specifically? I wasn't clear on that. Yeah, it's, well, I think to be set up or, or work, if there is a class specific, but then you know he goes to a twenty four hour fitness. Is there how? I guess you're asking how you can get set up. Um, uh, so. Uh, Go, go ahead, Joe. Um, well, I know Glenn has a, a gym, right? A, an exercise gym that is specific for, ex, um, for people with Parkinson's, so you might want to talk to Glenn about that. Um, but I know there are other um, exercise classes around the island. There's one, a, a boxing class in Kapolei, and there's cl classes at the Y specifically. I have a class at, at Polhainani that's um, it's not one-on-one, -on -one, but it's a group exercise class that's open to the community. Um, so um, I don't know. Uh, that's all I know about. Maybe somebody else knows some more. Uh, uh, yeah, just a, a couple of comments. So um, HPA has par uh, partnered with the YMCA's for, gosh, almost over a decade <laughs> in, in uh, designing uh, or having uh, Parkinson's group exercise classes uh, two times a week at most branches. Um, there's been some disruption in that with COVID and all that. And so uh, we're looking at um, what we do is try to every year or so um, – have a training to train the trainers on, on Parkinson's and, and to keep those classes going because we know that the, the classes lose instructors through attrition. They move or, or different things. And so uh, we are looking at holding another uh, big training for uh, all the YMCAs uh, so we can keep those going and grow as well as it's open to any kind of fitness professional who wants the information, right? So, so, so one reason we partnered with the YMCA's is that they're already trained in group exercise. We just need to teach the Parkinson's part of it and to help them put it together. And so, uh, um, so there'll be announcements through our website. You can also, again, I'm gonna be talking about the website a lot, parkinsonshawaii.org. Um, that is a great place to get resources here in Hawaii. So there is a listing of the different exercise programs throughout all the islands. 
Um, and so if you can get on there, you can kind of see if there's something in your area. But um, there'll be announcements too. If you know, let's say you go to the 24 hour fitness and uh, Tommy and you, there was an instructor that showed interest at learning about Parkinson's, then you know, invite them to that training when, when that comes out. So we'll, we'll, we'll put all that information out, but that's a, a excellent, excellent question. Okay, we got a question over here. Mike. <laughs> Say that again. Uh, um, actually, uh, Sandra is an instructor, but on the Big I'm, Island. I'm yeah. the Rock Steady. I'm the boxer. The only district in the state that does not have a Rock Steady boxing class offered. Who does? East Honolulu. East Honolulu. Do we have a Rock Steady boxing uh, there? Do you know, Glenn? It's kind of hard. Yeah. Implement the strategy of exercise being the thing that you do. Right. You don't have a team to do it. Either right. Well, rock steady boxing is just one avenue of exercise. You could go to it. In fact, um, I recently started taking my husband to a Kapuna cruise cycling class. And if you have a partner that can help you set up the bike, set up what to do. Oh, you want to hit. All right, get over here. I'll hit you. <laughs> So I think um, the Parkinson's Association will, can, can help you find that. Because he was just saying the YMCA's all are, um, are doing some. They're, they're participating. And, 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 uh, uh, um, and there are some boxing at some of the YMCA's as well. So uh, what, one of the uh, things that we're tasked with uh, as an association is, is to for awareness and then training. So, so again, if you're out there and you have uh, someone in your community that uh, uh, knows about fitness but wants to learn about Parkinson's, just send them our way and, and we'll, we'll help uh, facilitate. Uh, you know, our goal, we know that exercise is the best medicine, so our goal is to have as many programs and as many geographical areas going as possible. So, so you guys are our eyes and ears out there, so just oh, uh, let us know. I have, I have one other suggestion. You know, you can. there are a lot of Zoom classes that have rock steady boxing, and it's all non-contact anyway. So learning the punches uh, on a Zoom class, sort of like this gentleman, there's a lot that you can learn on your own and then go just go execute. Go to your, your particular gym if you're steady and you're comfortable doing that. And they have speed bags at all the gyms. And once you learn punches and what to do, you're free to go and do it on a regular basis by yourself. Does the Parkinson's Association have access to uh, these? Zoom classes? I believe so, yes. So uh, you can check our resources up there. Some of those are not, you know, they're, they're national programs. Um, but, you know, we, we, as we, we'll put links up and, and things like that. So, but, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have another question there in the back. Okay, can you wait for the mic microphone? Oh, right, right there, the gentleman right there. Okay. Is there a correlation between uh, diabetes and Parkinson's? I'm going to kick that to Dr. Turvac. <laughs> so I imagine where this question is also kind of stemming from is looking at some of these diabetes medications for Parkinson's, right? Yeah. Um, and so we don't have a direct correlation between diabetes and Parkinson's, although, you know, more and more we find that diabetes is part of what's even called the metabolic syndrome. So if we have diabetes, we have high blood pressure, we have you know, high cholesterol together, this puts us at a greater risk for a lot of things, including stroke. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Sorry. Um, so stroke and things of that nature. So although we haven't found a direct link to diabetes and Parkinson's, it's certainly a possibility, right? And so this goes back to hearkening and saying, hey, we really want to keep our bodies as physically fit as we can. And again, eating as well as we can. So keeping that heart healthy diet. And again, there is, you know, not to take anyone's speech from later, but we don't have like a specific diet for Parkinson's, right? But again, we know that anything that's not so great for the body, like lots of sugars, saturated fats, et cetera, it's not so good for the brain, right? So it stands to argue that 
probably not so great for Parkinson's. So again, there's no actual scientific link that we have so far, and we are looking at medications, you know, kind of in the realm of, we know that the gut is at least, you know, connected to our brain as well in the dopamine sort of fashion. Um, again, we don't have a perfect explanation for it, but yeah, it's a definitely a great question to have. All right. Any other audience questions? I, I just wanted to say something else. In Kailua, there's the most wonderful drumming class at the YMCA. Fabulous teacher. It is so much fun. Everybody laughs, and, and it's just, and you have to keep rhythm. You know, it's a rhythmatic thing. So she was sharing that, if you, if you couldn't hear, she was sharing that they're in Kailua YMCA. It's D's class, right? D's class. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they have a drumming class, and I, I've seen it. They're, they're drumming on everything, like Swiss balls and all kinds of different. Uh, um, but she said it's a great class, and you, you, know, you, you get your heart rate up, and you have a lot of fun. Is that? And the rhythm. Is and the rhythm. Constant. Yeah, awesome. Because it changes constantly. Awesome. All right. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Okay, so the question is, is Parkinson's hereditary? And uh, um, we'll just, well, I'm gonna leave it at that. And we'll go from there. Uh, I'm gonna kick that to you, Dr. Sure, yeah, I'll jump on that one. And guys, please feel free as well. Um, so the answer is yes and no. And so, <laughs> so we have discovered several genes that are in fact hereditary and passed down to families. And as, you know, kind of an interesting thing as a younger physician, we're seeing more and more genetic testing and we're involving more of that into our practice. And even recently at Queens, we've all kind of discussed, gosh, you know, before we were like, you know, if we get genetic testing, does it really make a difference? Um, and it does. And it does for a couple of reasons. And so one, it may give us some insight as to what to expect with your Parkinson's, right? And then additionally, you might qualify for clinical trials later as they come along. So, and if we already know that you have a specific mutation, then that's important for us to know because so we can say, hey, guess what? We have this ongoing thing going on, sorry. Um, <laughs> and so, and another reason would be to say, maybe there's more medications coming out, et cetera. So now we have a lot of theories of why Parkinson's happens, right? But we don't have a perfect, oh my gosh, there's always these genes that are involved. And so I would argue too, even if you did have positive genes and no symptoms, it doesn't mean that you're going to get Parkinson's. And this is where it becomes a little bit nuanced. And so this is part of the reason where we also partner with our genetic counselors. So not just your physicians, but there's a whole team of people that are involved when we talk about genetics and Parkinson's to say, hey, you might be at a little bit higher risk because you carry these genes. And this is kind of some of the things that came out with 23andMe. It's like, oh my gosh, I have this gene, I have that gene. Does that mean I'm gonna get this? No, not necessarily. But it's important to be aware, but not to necessarily anticipate and worry and stress, right? So, and the second part of your question is, is there you know, a way to do it and to check? The answer is yes. So. I would urge all of you to, if that's something you're interested in, discuss with your physician and say, hey, you know, I'm curious to learn about the genetics of Parkinson's. Do you think that it would be in my best interest to look into our genetics? And especially for family members, if you do have a family history, oh, where am I going? Oh, yes, getting there. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's where I was ending up. I'm getting a lot of pointing and you'll see why in a second. So. Again, that's why I encourage you to discuss with your physician, and then I can speak to what we're doing here at Queens. So we actually have a really neat study right now, and it's called PD Gene. And so if you see Emma here, kind of by the spinning wheel, yes. Um, so Emma is absolutely fantastic, and she's been helping us to recruit patients to be a part of this because sometimes, guess what, guys? Genetic testing can be really expensive, and insurance does not always cover it. So sometimes the best way to see is to actually be involved in a study. One, it helps you, but it also helps the community for Parkinson's so that we can learn more about the disease and find more things and work hopefully toward a cure. So please, you know, again, talk to your physicians and if you feel like, gosh, they're not sure, you know, reach out to the Hawaii Parkinson Association and we'll all try to get you to where you need to go in the right place. But yes, there are things that we can test for 
is the short answer. Great. Great. All right, next question. Um, and I'll direct this to Joe and uh, Sandy. Uh, how much, I think, meaning like duration, sets and reps, et cetera, and what type of exercise should I do to get the neuroprotective benefits of exercise? Yeah, so um, they're finding that um, aerobic exercise specifically um, can be neuroprotective. And we know that like exercise in general is good for the cells of the brain and everything. So, um, so aerobic exercise has shown that um, it, it can be neuroprotective. And so you want to be, the American, again, American um, Association of Parkinson's recommends uh, 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, three, three times a week at, uh, a, they say, a, a 70 to 80 percent of your max heart rate which a lot of people don't know what that is. So we use a perceived exertion scale. So it's how the rate of how hard you're working out. If you're thinking about a zero to 20, you wanna be about 14 to 17 is what they recommend. So a little bit higher heart rate, a little bit more aerobic. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about the high intensity interval training. And that's um, what I do in my exercise classes is we do um, an aerobic exercise, but then we do uh, like 20 seconds of really intense, you know, um, you know, deep squats with pushes or reaching overhead, and then we slow it down and then we bring it up again. And so, um, and they found that that type of exercise can be indeed um, neuroprotective. So um, I don't know, that's, that's what I found. Sandy? I concur. <laughs> <laughs> And again, it's, it's really, really, if, if you're only, con you know, 30 minutes, three times a week might be too much for you, do something, you know, make sure you're doing some type of exercise. If it's only like, again, just a few minutes every day, make sure you're doing something. It's very important. And one of the things I keep bringing my husband into this because he is my test monkey, <laughs> but you will be breathing hard. You, that's what she's just explained through uh, you can't just not get a little bit worn out in your exercise that's what the rest periods are for get worn out and then rest a little bit take some nice big breaths and get worn out again and then rest and this is all during the 30 to 40 minute time that you're with the instructor you're also going to be doing a warm-up and a cool down. So this whole thing is going to take you a good hour. Easy. And you know, Parkinson's people move slowly for a good reason. You, it's safer to move around slower. So don't get caught up in, oh my gosh, I have to do this for an hour, an hour and a half. It's good. You have slow transitions through it. And that's a good thing. Don't worry about, oh, I go so slow. It's okay. You're pushing, you know, you're trying. And that's what you need to do with Parkinson's. Try, exercise as much as you can, as hard as you can, as long as you can. That's really great. Um, and remember to check with your physician before you start exercise. That's the other important thing is, you know, just if you've never, if you're new to exercise and you're, you know, you don't want to jump into 30 minutes, 40 minutes of high intensity exercise right off the bat without consulting a physician or your healthcare. Um, provider. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And for the rock steady boxing, part of that program is you're cleared with your physician. It's, it's all kind of one of the whole things. But get, you know, I can't imagine that there'd be one doctor that would say, oh, gosh, no, don't go. Because even people who are in wheelchairs, every exercise can be modified to whatever, uh, for a walker. You can have your walker. I mean, just, it sounds so corny, just do it, but it is, that's it. <laughs> yes. Just one other comment about the high, in uh, high intensity interval training or the HIT training. Uh, when they did the studies, you know, so we know that, that um, from, on animal studies, that, you know, aerobic activity can be neuroprotective and all that. There's an added benefit if you add in intensity. And when they, we looked at the intensity studies, and, and if you Google uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Albert, uh, uh, it's a fascinating st uh, uh, story uh, about forced exercise. But what they found out is that something about intensity triggers the receptors in your brain 
that gra the, they're called D2 receptors that grab the dopamine that you still are producing. So you're basically metabolizing your own dopamine and it's, it's not a medication, right? So there's no side effects, you get the real deal. So, so, uh, so we incorporate when we teach the, train the trainers at the YMCA, or we really, really emphasize that HIT training, the high intensity interval training. So not only do you have the neuroprotective benefit, but maybe you can tap into that benefit of, of exciting your receptors and, and metabolizing your own dopamine a little bit better. And anecdotally, when I work with people and do this, and, and you don't have to, you know, it's hard. You, not everybody can like, okay, I'm gonna get on an exercise bike and I'm gonna pound it out for 30 minutes. I can't hardly even do that So <laughs> on a step or so. Breaking it up in small little pieces, uh, you can tap into those benefits. So you might start out with doing, uh, you know, 30 seconds easy on a recumbent bike and then go hard as you can for, 10 seconds and do 30 and 10 seconds and your first workout may be five minutes, but you'll start tapping into that, to that benefit. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And one reason that Rock City Boxing got so popular is it's the ultimate hit. <laughs> it's high intensity interval training, right? So, so it kind of fits into the whole, the whole thing. So. And it is kind of fun to hit things. <laughs> we have any other uh, questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Yes. Uh, I have this sort of flat space at my house, and uh, I exercise on it. It's called my bed. <laughs> <laughs> and first thing in the morning, I get up. I, I, I can't get out of bed. I'm too tired. So I do these stretching exercises and tension exercises with these straps and stuff like that. And I do that for a while. And then it's easier to get out of bed. Great, great. And uh, there's this thing, another book I have called Eat the Frog. I don't know if you've ever heard of the book called Eat the you eat the frog? Eat the frog. A bu okay, I'm, now I'm curious. You, you, you got my... <laughs> the first thing in the morning, if what you do is eat the frog, the rest of your day is going to be easier because you've got the hard part out. <laughs> so, do the exercise first thing in the morning. Do the exercises first thing in the morning before you get out of bed. And then it's easier to get out of bed and you've already accomplished something for the day, so you're proud of that. All right, great. I, eat the frog. I'm going to steal that. I kind of like that. All right. Any, any other questions or comments from the audience? I will make a quick comment on that. So um, I love that you reward yourself. You know, that's a big part of, um, of, of this journey, right, is every little thing that you do, you know, take a moment to reward yourself. And, you know, one of the things I tell my residents is that, you know, find something that is specific for you. So if you're having postural instability, that's your main concern, then really focus on doing exercises that's going to help that, whether that's standing up against a wall and then really working on your posture, seeing, seeing what your posture looks like or strengthening your core muscles. Or if it's, you know, you're walking, then really find something that you can do to really work on, you know, stretching your legs out far in front of you and swinging your arms and work with, walk with purpose. You know, you're really purposely walking with intention. Um, so find something that you, that you find will help you specifically and really focus on that because I think that will help your quality of life. Uh, don't procrastinate. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, a little, you can procrastinate, but just don't make it a whole day thing. <laughs> don't make a class out of it. Any, any more questions? Yes. Not a question, but a comment. Okay. Um, so my husband was, my husband was in Rock City Boxing, and it's in Kapolei, and it's run by Coach Ichi Jumawan, who was a 1976, I believe, gold um, boxer. He won the world championship in boxing, and so he set up that program. And it's in Kapolei, we live in Mililani, but we had people from Hawaii Kai, Kaneohe, Mauna Loa, from all over the island going to that gym two or three times a week because they felt it was worth it. And you know, if you find something and you like it, you know, you would go for it. But I saw a lot of great progress, and we did have people in wheelchairs, people with walkers, but we also had people who were just beginning in Parkinson's and they had tremendous progress because of the boxing, that they were able to walk better than you know, when they came in. So I wouldn't put distance you know, as a problem. You might wanna seek it out and just try it for a while. It might help you. Great, great comment. And then again, uh, the website for the Hawaii Parkinson's Association is parkinsonshawaii.org and uh, that class is listed under uh, fitness and exercise, so you can find uh, information of the, 
location and time. So that any more questions from the audience or comments? Yes. Uh, about walking, interval walking. Uh, the Japanese have uh, watched the Japanese program, and there's a program three minutes of regular walking, and you break out with three minutes of moving your arms, like you said, flailing. Take long steps, heel toe, three minutes, and one session is three and slow. And for five minutes, five, five sessions, we'll give you 30 seconds, 30 minutes. And I was telling my cousin to do that because I can't do that anymore. But uh, people, I know a lot of people walk, and doing the interval walking does help. You know, three and three. Awesome, awesome. All right, so uh, we're actually doing great on time. I, I think we're going to wrap this panel up. We're going to get final comments from our panelists. So why don't we just start with Lauren, and we'll work our way here. So sure. closing comments. Yeah. yeah, again, you guys have really asked some wonderful questions, and we're also around for more um, as you go along. So I did actually, to your point, I just wanted to make another comment about very intentional movements. So something that you'll kind of hear us say in the Parkinson's world is, when we first have our body, it's kind of like having an automatic car and everything works really well. However, once we have Parkinson's, it's kind of like driving a manual. And I don't know how many of you have driven a manual or a stick, but it's kind of hard. Um, you know, you have to really think through and again, be very intentional in your movements. And that's hard to do, but it can be done. So when you're exercising, you know, take a little bit of extra time to think. And, you know, you've probably also heard of programs like big and loud, et cetera. So again, we want to take big steps. We want to speak loudly. And even though if we're not going as quickly as we once could, having the intention of moving and really being thoughtful with it um, is very, very important. So in any kind of exercise that you're pursuing. But great questions today, guys. Well, thank you all for um, being here today and um, sharing. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to share is, um, you know, exercise is different for everyone and finding your, 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 your place where you're successful is really important. Um, I have a, a resident that um, struggled with our, some general exercise classes for a really long time. You know, she had a lot of stiffness and rigidity and um, we found that music was really her thing. And so every time we would, she would come to class, we would play some, um, some classical or ballroom dance type music. And she would just light up and she would float around the room. And this was her thing that really helped her. So I think it's really important to find what, what will work for you specifically. And again, like what I was saying, you know, find the thing that you're finding that might be your, your biggest struggle and really focus on that, whatever that is. So, um, and, um, it may not be, it may not be, uh, the same all the time, so you know, it might change. So you know, kind of adjust with that. But but move your bodies every day and and find something that makes you have fun. You know, having fun is really important as well. You know, find something that um, you enjoy and and, and and stick to it. And it's hard to even add anything more to that other than really sincerely thank you all for coming. Education as best we can reach out. We can't reach you to help you if you don't reach back. And so coming here is really, really important. Working with your care partner um, and understanding that your care partner has a, has a road to go down too. So give in a little to them. We love you. I, I am probably the one care partner up here. Don't make me cry. But we do we love our care our care person we want you to give back reach out so we can put these things all into action and i can't can't disagree at all with the de deliberate movements and that can happen everywhere it'll make you safer in your home if you deliberately think about what you're doing in your home when you're doing your little activities of daily life that are really important. Don't, don't have your care partner do everything for you. It's not good for you. And it, it isn't good for your care partner either. But thank you very much for coming. All right, let's uh, give a hand to our panel. Yeah.